Chapter 12 Sabriel regained consciousness slowly, her brain fumbling f for connections to her senses. Hearing came first, but that only caught her own laboring breath, breathing, her own labored breathing, and the creak of her armored coat as she struggled to sit up. For the moment, slight sight eluded her, and she was panicked, afraid of blindness, till memory came. It was night, and she was at the bottom of a sinkhole. A great circular shaft bore into the ground by either nature or artifice. From her brief glimpse of it as they'd fallen, she had guessed, or she'd guessed it. <clears throat> was easily 50 yards in diameter and a hundred deep. Daylight would probably illuminate its murky depths, but starlight was sufficient, insufficient. <clears throat> Pain came next, hard on the heels of memory, a thousand aches and bruises, but no serious injury. Sabriel wiggled her toes and fingers, flexed muscles in arms, back, and legs. They all hurt, but everything seemed to work. She vaguely recalled the last few seconds before impact. Mogget, or the white force, slowing, slowing them just before they hit. But the actual instant of the crash might never have been, for she couldn't remember it. Shock, she thought to herself in an abstract way, almost like she was diagnosing someone else. Her next thought came some time later, and, it, and with it the realization that she must have passed out again. With this awakening, she felt a little sharper, her mind catching some slight breeze to carry her out of a metal doldrums out of the metal doldrums working by touch she strapped she unstrapped herself and felt behind her for the pack in her current state even a simple charter spell for light was out of the question but there were candles there and matches or the clockwork igniter <coughs> As the match flared, Sabriel's heart sank. In the small, flickering globe of yellow light, she saw that only the central cockpit portion of the paper wing survived. The sad blue and silver corpse of the once marvelous creation. Its wings lay torn and crumpled underneath it, and the entire nose section lay some yards away shorn off completely. One eye stared up at the circular patch of sky above, but it was no longer fierce and alive. Just yellow paint and laminated paper. Sabriel stared at the wreckage. Regret and sorrow coursing like influenza in her bones till the match burnt her finger. She lit another, and then a candle, expanding both her light and field of vision. More small pieces of the paper wing were slewn over a large, open, flat area. Groaning with the effort of motivating bristles, bruises, muscles, bruised muscles, mm. Sabriel leveled herself out of the cockpit to have a closer look at the ground. This revealed a flat area to be man-made flagstones, carefully laid. Grass had grown, long grown between the stones and lichen upon them, so it was clearly not recent work. Sabriel sat on the cool stones and wondered why anyone would do such a work at the bottom of a sinkhole. 
thinking seemed to be thinking seemed mm -mm. thinking about that seemed to kickstart her befuddled wits and she started to wonder about a few other things where for instance was the forest that had once been Moggett and what was it that reminded her to fetch her sword and check the bells Her turbaned helmet had rotated around on her head and was almost back to front. Slowly, she slid it around, feeling ever, every slight movement all the way down her now very stiff neck, balancing her first candle on the paving in the pool of cooling wax. She dragged her pack and weapons out of the wreckage and lit another two candles. She put one down near the first and took the other to light her way. Walking around the destroyed paper wing, searching for any signs of Moggett. At the dismembered prow of the craft, she gently touched the eyes, wishing she could close them. I am sorry, she whispered. Perhaps I will be able to make a new paper wing one day. There should be another to carry on your name. Sentiment Abhorsen, said a voice somewhere behind her. A voice that managed to sound like Moggett and not all like him at the same time. It was louder, harsher, less human, and every word seemed to crackle like the electric generators she'd used in Waverly College science classes. Where are you? asked Sabriel, swiftly turning. The voice had sounded close, but there was nothing visible within the sphere of candlelight. She held her own candle higher and transferred it to her left hand. Here! <laughs> snickered the voice, and Sabriel saw lines of white fire run out from under the ruined fuselage, lines that lit the paper laminate as they ran, so that within a second the paper wing was burning fiercely, yellow-red flames dancing under thick white smoke, totally obscuring whatever had emerged from under the stricken craft. No, denth, no death sense twitched, but Sabriel could almost smell the, fee, the free magic. Tangy, unnatural, nerve jangling, tainting the thick odor of natural smoke. Then she saw the white fire lines again, streaming out, converging roiling coming together and a blazing blue-white creature stepped out from the f funeral pyre of the paper wing. Sabriel couldn't look at it directly, but from the corners of her arm-shielded eyes she saw something human in shape, taller than her and thin, almost starved. It had no legs. The tar torso and head balanced upon a column of twisting, whirling force. Free, save for the blood price, it said, advancing. All trace of Magus' voice was lost now, submerged to zapping, crackling menace. Sabriel had no doubt about the meaning of the blood price and who would pay it. Summoning all her remaining energies, she called three charter marks to the forefront of her mind and hurled them towards the thing, shouting their names. Annette! Kalu! Fahan! The marks became silver blades as they left her mind, hands, mind, and voice flashing through the air, swifter 
than any thrown dagger and went straight through the shining figure, apparently without effect. <laughs> it laughed a series of rises and falls like a dog screaming in pain and lazily slid forward. Its languid motion seemed to declare it would have no more trouble disposing of Sabriel than it had in burning the paper wing. Sabriel drew her sword and backed away, determined not to panic as she had done when, when faced by the mornicant. Her head flickered back and for, backwards and forwards, neck pain forgotten, checking the ground behind her and marking her opponent. Her mind racing, considering options, perhaps one of the bells, but that would mean dropping the candle. Could she count on the creature's blazing presence to light her way? Almost as if it could read her mind, the creature suddenly closed. The creature suddenly started to lose its brilliance, sucking darkness into its swirling body like a sponge soaking up ink. Within a few seconds, Sabriel could barely make it out. A fearful silhouette backlit by the orange glow of the burning paper wing. Desperately, Sabriel tried to remember what she knew of free magic elements and constructs. Her father had rarely mentioned them, and Magistrix Greenwood had only lightly delved into the subject. Sabriel knew the binding spell for two of the lesser kindred of free magic beings, but the creature before her was neither Margrude nor Silken. Keep thinking, Abhorzin, laughed the creature, advancing again. Such a pity your head doesn't work too well. You saved it from not working forever, replied Sabriel replied warily. It had braked the paper wing after all. Some perhaps so perhaps there was some good in it somewhere, some remnant of Moggett. If only it could be brought out. Sentiment The thing replied, still silently sliding forward. It laughed again, and a dark, tendril-like arm suddenly unleashed itself, snapping across the intervening space to strike Sabriel across the face. Mm. A memory now purged, it added as Sabriel staggered back from a, from a second attack sword flashing across to parry. Unlike the silver spell darts, the charter etched blade did connect with the unnatural flesh of the creature, but it had no effect apart from jarring Sabriel's arm. Her nose was bleeding too, a small and salty flow stinging her wind-chafed lips. She tried to ignore it, tried to use the pain of what was probably a broken nose to get her mind back to full operational speed. Memories, yes, many memories, continued the creature. It was circling around her now, pushing her back the way she they'd come, back towards the fading fire of the paper wing. That would burn out soon, and then there would only be darkness, for Sabriel's candle was now a lump of blown-out wax, fallen, forgotten, from her hand. Millennia of servitude, Abhorson, chained by trickery, treachery, captive in a repulsive fixed flesh shape. But there will be payment, slow payment, not quick, not quick at all. The tendril lashed out, low this time, trying to trip her. Sabriel leapt over it, blade extended, 
lunging for the creature's chest, but it shimmied aside, extruding extra arms as she tried to jump back, catching her in mid-leap, drawing her close. Sword arm pinuetted at her side. It tightened its grip till she was close against its chest, her face a mere finger width from its boiling, constantly moving flesh, as if a billion tiny insects buzzed behind a membrane of utter darkness. Another arm gripped the back of her helmet, forcing her to look up till she saw its head directly above her, a thing of most basic anatomy. Its eyes were like a sinkhole, deep pits without apparent bottom. It had no nose but a mouth that split the horrid face in two, a mouth slightly parted to reveal a burning blue-white glare that it had first used as flesh. All charter magic had fled from Sabriel's mind, her sword trapped, the bells likewise, and even if they weren't, she didn't know how to use them properly against things that things not dead. She ran over them mentally anyway, in a frantic, lightning inventory of anything that might help. It was then her tired, concussed mind remembering the ring. It was on the left hand, on her left hand, her free hand, cool silver on the index finger. But she didn't know what to do with it. The creature's head was bowing towards her own, its neck stretching impossibly long till it was like a snake's head rearing above her, the mouth opening wider, growing brighter, fizzing with white hot sparks that fell upon her helmet and face, burning cloth and skin, leaving tiny tattoo-like scars. The ring felt loose on her finger. Sabriel instinctively curled her hand, and the ring felt looser still, slipping down her finger, expanding, growing, till without looking, Sabriel knew she had, knew she held a silver hoop as wide or wider than the creature's slender head, and she suddenly knew what to do. First, a plucking of an eye, said the thing, breath as hot as a f the falling sparks, scorching her face with instant sunburn. It tilted its head sideways and opened its mouth wider, lowering lower jaw dislocating out. Sabriel <sighs> took one last careful look, screwed her eyes tight against the terrible glaze or glare, and flipped the silver hoop up, and she hoped over the thing's neck. For a second, as the heat increased, and she felt a terrible burning pain against her eye. Sabriel thought she'd missed. Then the hoop was wrenched, wrenched from her hand, and she was thrown away, hurled like an angry fisherman's rejected minnow. On the cool flagstone again, she opened her eyes, the left one blurry, sore, and swimming with tears. But they're still, and still working. She had put the silver hoop over the thing's head, and it had slowly, and it was slowly sliding down that long, skinuous neck. The ring was shrinking again as it slid, impervious of the creature's desperate attempts to get it off. It had six or seven hands now, formed directly from its shoulders all squirming about, trying to force fingers under the ring, but the metal seemed in inimical in the creature's substance. 
like a hot pan to human fingers, for the fingers flinched and danced around it, but could not take hold for longer than a second. The darkness was stained, or the darkness that stained it was ebbing too, draining down through its thrashing, twisting support, leaving glowing whiteness behind. Still the creature fought with the ring, blazing hands forming and reforming, body twisting and turning, even buckling, as if it could throw the ring like a rider from a horse. Finally, it gave up and turned towards Sabriel, screaming and crackling. Two long arms sprang out from it, reaching towards Sabriel's sprawling body, talons growing from the hands, racking the stone with deep gouges as they scraped, as they scrabbled towards her, like spiders scurrying to their prey. Only a short fall, only, mm, only to fall short by a yard or more. No! Howled the thing. And its whole twisting, contorting, coiling body lurched forward, killing arms outstretched. Again, the talons fell short as Sabriel crawled, rolled, and pushed herself away. Then the silver ring contracted once more, and a terrible shout of anguish, rage, and despair came from the very center of the white, flaming thing. Its arms suddenly shrank back to its torso. The head fell into its shoulders, and the whole body sank into an amorphous blob of shimmering white with a single, still large, silver band around the middle. The ruby glittering like a drop of blood. Sabriel stared at it, unable to look aside or do anything else, even quell the flow from, the bleeding, from her bleeding nose, which now covered half her face and chin her mouth glued shut with dried and clotting blood. It seemed to hear, it seemed to her that something was left undone, something that she had to provide. Nervously crawling closer, she saw that there were now marks on the ring, charter marks that told her what she must do. Warily, she got up on her knees and fumbled with the bell bandolier. Sarah Neff was heavy, almost beyond her strength, but she managed to draw it out, and the deep, compelling voice rang through the sinkhole, seeming to pierce the glowing, silver-bound mass. The ring hummed in the air, and the bell... The ring hummed in answer to the bell and exclude exude a pear ex, ex dud, a pear shaped drop of its own metal which cooled to become a miniature sarinath at the same time the ring changed color and consistency the ruby's color seemed to run and the red wash spread through the silver it was now dull an ordinary, no longer a silver band, but a red leather collar with a miniature Sarinath bell. With this change, the white mass quivered and shone bright again till Sabriel had to shield her eyes once more. Then the shadows grew together again. She looked back, and there was Mogget, collared in red leather, sitting up and looking like he was about to throw up a hairball. It wasn't a hairball, but a silver ring, the ruby reflecting Mogget's internal light. It rolled to Sabriel, tinkling across the floor, or across the stone. She picked it up and slid it back onto her finger. 
Moggett's glow faded, and the burning paper wing was now only faint embers. Sad memories and ash. Darkness returned, cloaking Sabriel, wrapping her up with all her hurts and fears. She sat silent, not even thinking. A little later, she felt a soft cat nose against her folded hands, and a candle damp from Moggett's mouth. Your nose is still bleeding, said a familiar dedantic voice. Light the candle, pinch your nose, and get some blankets out for us to sleep. It's getting cold. Welcome back, Moggett, whispered Sabriel.